team. Give it everything you got. It's time to fangirl flail with fangirls going rogue. Count me in. Never get between a Mandalorian and a weapons package. This is the way. Yeah, News, discussion, and commentary from the female point of view. You call this a diplomatic solution? No, I call it aggressive negotiations. She's as important as he is. With your hosts, Trisha Barr and Sarah Woloski. Boy, am I glad to hear your voice. Strap in, because this is where the fun begins. I like the sound of that. Welcome, Yub Cubs, to Fangirls Going Rogue. What? Another episode? Oh my gosh. Well, we are coming to you with a really fun episode here. I am Sarah Woloski from Skywalking Through Neverland, and joining me is Trisha Barr from Fangirl Blog. Trisha, welcome. I am so excited to talk about these interviews that we had for Andor. Yes, we have a very special show for you today. And like Trisha says, we are going to get you hyped for Andor, which is coming September 21st with three episodes on Disney+. Plus. So now it's really funny because initially Andor was scheduled for August 31st. And so at the end of July, we got an invitation to a special press conference and roundtables for Andor. And so way back on August 5th, <laughs> we participated in this press conference and roundtables. And it was in the the getting ready for this press conference that they announced that Andor would be pushed back to September 25th. So this is super odd for us to be like covering or like having this press conference like two months almost before everyone is going to see Andor. It's very odd. It's very odd, but it it gave us time. We didn't have that panic, that rush of having to <laughs> yes. try to put all this stuff to, together and get everything. You know, sometimes people just throw up these interviews, but we really want to give you the best parts of the interviews, the parts that we think are going to make you interested and excited for Andor. And and particularly the characters and these actors that are going to be playing these characters. I feel very much like they're excited about the show, like Star Wars actors often are. Yeah. And one of the key things about roundtables is you really get to know these actors' personalities and see how then that translates on the screen. And I really love that. So we're going to share with you, just like Trisha said, some really cool things that we learn and and curated for you guys, our, our Yub Cubs. So these roundtables featured key members of the cast, along with Tony Gilroy, who is the executive producer and writer of this series, Diego Luna. He plays Cassian Andor. Genevieve O'Reilly plays Mon Mothma. Adria Arjona plays Bix Colleen. Denise Guff plays Deidre Miro. And Kyle Soler plays Cyril Karn. Now, there are no spoilers here. In fact, some of the actors were very careful to not <laughs> say any spoilers. <laughs> and so you guys can listen with a free ear and get hyped for Andor. Absolutely. The virtual roundtable that had everybody together, which are some of my favorite things because you get them to interact a little more and they can kind of feed off one another. That was hosted by Joe Newmar, a film critic with New York's WOR Radio. You won't hear his questions. We're just going to kind of summarize and jump into things and maybe jump around a little bit between some of the roundtables to really kind of make this flow and be a really fun listen for you. So I thought we'd just start with Tony Gilroy talking about his vision for the show. I think the main idea is, to, is we have a character in Rogue One and we know where he ends up and we know how accomplished and complicated he is. And the idea that we can do a story that takes him from his, or, literally from his childhood origins and walk him through uh, a five year history of uh, an odyssey that, that, that takes him to that place during a revolution, during a moment in history in a, in a place where uh, huge events are happening and real people are being crushed by it 
the fact that we could fo follow uh, somebody as an example of a revolution all the way through to the end that that was the exciting that was that was the that was the that was the walk in for me that was the buy in the the opportunity to do that and to yeah. center our story around that look. There are a lot of characters in our show. Many of them are here today, but there's there, there are others. Everyone is going to be circulating and spinning and intersecting around the Cassie and Andor story as we move uh, as we move towards Rogue One. Um, but uh, it's a potent moment in history, uh, and a lot of people are are uh, are facing a lot of really. Uh, difficult times and difficult decisions along the way. And, and that's what the show is about. The, the opportunity to do that on a large scale, on a big canvas, that's, that's why I'm here. And as we go along, you'll notice that many of the actors refer back to Tony Gilroy. So he was really the point person for the vision on this series. So what he says here really take to heart when you're going to watch. No, they all had such high praise. Just that was like a through line. As mm -hmm. I was writing my article for Fangirl Blog, everybody had praise for him. So they all seemed to be really impressed and excited that that he was really the reason a lot of these people, you know, you think, oh, you're doing a Star Wars show. And Pete, that would be enough reason. But he seemed to really be the thing that took it up a notch. Some of these people might not have done Star Wars otherwise. Mm. Indeed. But we do know one person who is excited by, about Star Wars and has done Star Wars, and that's Diego Luna. And he talks a little bit about getting back into Star Wars and makes some great points about Rogue One as a movie versus what they are trying to do with this show and or. First of all, the, the, just the, the chance to be back working with this family, getting, getting to do more stuff with Tony, which uh, is, is someone I, I I admire and I love his company and 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 collaborating with him is is amazing. Uh, so just being back felt great. but uh, I think I think Rogue one is a is a film about an event, you know. You don't get to know those characters. You don't get to understand exactly where they come from, what needed to happen. And uh, for me, it's it's quite relevant today to tell the story of what needs to happen for a revo revolutionary to emerge, to exist, to come to life. You know, to what gives the the what gives meaning in the life of someone to be willing to sacrifice everything for a cause. You know what. What needs to happen? That that journey matters to me, and uh, the character says stuff that uh, it haunts me in in Rogue One. You know that he he started the fight since he was six years old. What does that mean exactly? You know why a, a six year old would miss his childhood uh, and start a fight? Uh, that to me is really interesting to 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 know. Um, he talks about a dark past. He talks about doing terrible stuff for the rebellion. What is what is he referring to? I, I think that story matters. That story is interesting, and there is a, a lot of material there for for us to play. So I was I was really excited to to be able to go into that journey and uh, and uh, give those answers. You know. Diego is just so adorable. There's like no other word for him. <laughs> well, speaking of Diego Luna, Sarah, you asked this question and I want you to talk about it. I was surprised with where it went. You never know when you ask this type of question. So, yes. Okay. So when it came time to for the press conference, you know, Tony Gilroy is the showrunner, right? And so I wanted to ask a music question of him, like, how does this music compare with like the music of Star Wars? Because the music of Star Wars is so iconic, right? And so what are they going to do differently to make it stand out? So I wasn't able to ask that question of Tony Gilroy, but Diego Luna has been talking even at Star Wars Celebration how he's been working on Andor for like four years leading up to this point. And so I figured I'd ask him my music question in the off chance that he would have some interesting story or something fun like that. So let's listen to his answer here. I, I have to say that I witness uh, the process of uh, the I witnessed the process 
always impressed by what was happening. You know, uh, it's uh, Tony Gilroy. It, it, it's it's quite an interesting leader. Uh, uh, he thinks of everything uh, before you're even shooting. You know, uh, I'll tell you a story. There is one scene. I won't tell you which scene because uh, I will be spoiling uh, the story. But uh, there was a piece of music that ex that was created before we even shot the scene where that music is part of the score, and it's 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 happening there. Like there is there is this piece of music that matters so much in an episode that it existed before we even like went on shooting. And uh, I was on set playing a moment, like a, a scene where this music is going to be playing, you know, and uh, and I could hear the music when I was shooting, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this story because I think Tony writes and when he writes, he has to know uh, what the space of th that he's writing for is. You know, it has to be designed already. You know, uh, the space where the scene happens. He doesn't write like, "Well, this happens in the lobby of a hotel." Da da da. No, he says this happens in the lobby of a hotel that is like this. Uh, and uh, and you can tell he had a drawing and he worked with the production designer before writing the scene on what space was the scene going to happen in, you know, uh, same thing with the music. I think he, he ambitions how things are going to sound before they're even shot, you know, and when he's writing, he has that in mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So when, when you ask me about the music, I was, I was just celebrating every step of the, of the process, you know, because he's so much in control. And obviously we have like, no, not a composer, we have the composer, you know? Okay, so the composer he's talking about is Nicholas Brittle. And Nicholas has worked on Moonlight and the Succession TV series, as well as a bunch of documentaries and a bunch of shorts leading up to that point. So when Diego Luna said, oh, I'll, I'll tell you a story, I got so excited. I was like, okay, what's he gonna tell us? And <laughs> so he did tell us, I mean, what we learned was that Tony Gilroy was able to have music playing during filming certain scenes. And I'm sure that helped the actors get into the emotional space for the scene. But but Diego Luna didn't really finish the story. I was like, oh, well, tell us how that informed your performance. But we weren't allowed to ask follow up questions. He only got episode one of the story. It's, yes. it's serial. So we will figure that out. Hopefully we'll know the moment. We'll be like, that's the music. Maybe he'll bring it back up when that time comes. I'm hoping. I'm feeling that it's probably one of a, a big scene, you know, like at the end, probably a big climactic scene. Diego also got asked about the process of just, we know that Rogue One sort of developed. It wasn't exactly the movie that we thought it was like, you know, the the running on the beach with the Death Star plans, it was in the first trailer, isn't in the movie. They had to change things. They had to cut things. One of the important parts about the changing of Rogue One was Tony Gilroy. He came in, he worked on the script. He actually did some directing. He's not credited as a director, but he's credited as a, an, a writer, screenwriter on the movie. And so Diego was asked, if Andor was similar to that process, like was it something different and evolved into something else or how it played out? So let's hear what he says about that. Uh, but but there is something that happens and, and it's the nature of collaboration, you know? It's like, there's an idea, but then uh, a producer comes in, you know, like Sana and, uh, and her perspective matters and then suddenly, that sh shapes the project in a different way. Then we start working with Luke, who's the, the set designer, the production designer, who's uh, an amazing mind. And, uh, uh, and and when he starts designing, even the scenes change, you know, because they are going to happen in a different place. So the writing has to change. And then you cast 
the project, you know? And uh, even though you had in mind someone, uh, when you end up casting, uh, an amazing actor comes uh, out of nowhere and you go like, shit, that's, that's a character. And that transforms things. So, and, and that happens more in 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 this format in 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 a series than than in film you know because a series it's like the process starts for the first block uh, and you start shooting while you know there's stuff that is still being written you know it's a machine that doesn't doesn't stop so obviously uh things are not what they are till you you finish all the process um but what I can tell you is that the the energy, the the vision, it's been it's been one since since the start, you know, since we 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 started pre-producing this, and and it's Tony Gilroy's, uh, and uh, and obviously all of us we are around to collaborate and to uh, help his vision elevate to where it deserves, you know. But uh, but it's all about his vision. So he did mention something interesting about the series versus the movie. And that is like most like television series is that, you know, you're shooting first episodes while the later episodes are still being written. And so like if something, if an actor brings out a certain aspect of a character that the writers weren't expecting, well, they can then compound that in later episodes. So I feel like that's what happened here. For sure. And, you know, they hired a lot of people who have strong television experience. So mm -hmm. it just seems like just the fact that there were more voices in the room. And that's sort of what he's saying, this collaboration that you end up with just a stronger story, because it's not a singular vision. Or in the case of Rogue One, they were trying to coalesce a bunch of ideas that hadn't really been uh you know, there was this kind of war movie and there was a heist movie and they weren't really gelling and Tony Gilroy had to come in and do that, which apparently he does for a lot of movies. I just went looking him up and there's quite a few movies that Tony Gilroy comes in and sweeps up uh, and makes something out of maybe something that isn't as understood or needs some tidying up. Huh. That's but good. Well, that's interesting because it, it's a little goes against what we just said at the beginning, which is Tony Gilroy was like, had the vision for it. It sounds like he's a good leader that's able to bring a lot of people together, much like George Lucas did. A absolutely. And in this and different is that this is his idea and concept. And then the scope of it is just so enormous. It's not something that he can do on his own. Like a film is two and a half hours. You can't just make 12 hours of a TV show. You're going to need a lot of time, or if you don't have that time, which I'm sure in Star Wars, you know, they're wanting to get this out there. You're going to have to bring in other people to kind of go there and look for that. Mm -hmm. I was really excited that we got to speak to Genevieve O'Reilly because, you know, she's one of our girls for a while. She was one of our only girls. We had mm -hmm. Leia and Mon and that was it in Star <laughs> <Yeah>. Wars. <laughs> and so we had Padme on screen Brian from Pink Milk wanted to ask a personal question, and I loved it. He asked for any advice from, from Mon Mothma for queer people. And let's hear what she had to say. Yeah, I'm going to lean into where we find Mon Mothma in Andor. And she is somewhere different than we've seen her before. Usually she's surrounded by a band of rebels. She's in with like-minded thinking people. When we meet her at the beginning of Andor, she is a lonely voice in opposition. She is trying to have a voice in a, in a space, in a workplace, in a world where everyone seems to be thinking differently to her. And they are oppressing her ideas. They are oppressing people. What, we're, what we know in Star Wars, and we know where we're going to go in Andor is very different from where we start. Where we start, we have all these characters, both Mon Mothma and Cassian Andor, among others, who feel alone in their fight, who feel alone in their beliefs, in their ideas. I think what, we ex what, what will happen going forward is that they will find each other 
that they will reach out, that they will risk, that they will find their community. And it is in finding your community that, that you can collaborate and you can stand up and you can seek to make a change and revote together. It is all about community, isn't it? Once you find your tribe, I mean, that's true in high school too. I mean, you just think about it, the cliques, right? That's why kind of why they form. <laughs> you had the band geeks, you had the popular kids. And yeah, I don't know. Once you find your tribe, you just feel accepted. It was beautiful what she said. And I just, I just loved it. I loved her answer. I love the, the spirit of it. And going on from that, I got to ask her a question and love the answer that I got from her. And, you know, this is one of those things where you feel like, you know, there were all these scenes that we knew were there. That's part of Star Wars is they give us like, you know, the, the cut scenes and that kind of stuff and all that stuff that got cut, the politics and Revenge of the Sith, how Padme was working with Mon and Bail Organa to form this uh, rebel alliance. It wasn't that at that point because they didn't know they needed to be a rebel alliance. They just thought they were fighting within the system. But all of that got cut, most of it. I mean, she has a very small small role in Revenge of the Sith compared to what they filmed originally. So my question was to ask about, would it be worth the wait that we didn't get to see those? And here's her answer. I hope so. That's what was so exciting for me to come in and step into Tony Gilroy's writing in Andor. He is writing not just the political figure, not just for Mon Mothma, the the rebel or who will become the rebel leader, but he is writing for her as a woman, what it costs to be this figure, how dangerous it is to for her to stand up for what she believes in. And I think we will, given the time and the narrative space that Tony and Disney are investing in her, I think it will be worthwhile. I think the wait is worthwhile and I'm excited to have the opportunity to play it. I think back to the days of the Clone Wars when it ended abruptly with after yes. the sale to Disney and a lot of us were heartbroken, including you and I and Teresa also, who was hosting with us then. And that was hard to know that we weren't going to get to see the end or get to see something that we knew was like existed. Same thing with these cutscenes, like they had storyboarded and they had stories and written episodes of the rest of the Clone Wars. They knew kind of where they wanted to go. And we did get to see season seven and ultimately I think it was better than what they were going to give us. Originally, we got, you know, more fleshed out things. They went away from sort of that Ahsoka having another guy that she was a romance for her. And she ended up getting friends instead with the Martez sisters. So I'm hoping, and it just seems like Genevieve's hinting that we're going to get to see so much more that it'll be worth the wait from all those years ago, 20 years of waiting yes. to see Mon Mothma get to ha shine a little more and get to see the role she played. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I mean, because in Return of the Jedi, she just kind of pops up in that one main scene, you know, and, and that's the first time I knew of her. And so fleshing out her character in this series, I think, is really going to inform those scenes as well. So it'd be fun to watch like Return of the Jedi after this or anything, you know, when you well, even like Rogue One, you watch Star Wars and it's like a whole different movie after seeing Rogue One. So it's I think that's going to be neat. And there's some some teases like there there are some really cool scenes with with Mon Mothma. So I'm hoping to see much more though, too. For sure. <laughs> I can't say anything else. <laughs> but We're I want being to. so good, you guys. It's so hard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there and get to talk about it with everybody. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that isn't a spoiler, but that we know just being Star Wars fans is that there has to be costumes 
and Mon Mothma is a senator and we think of Padme and all her regalia and outfits and Charlotte Arity of Sky Talkers asked about Mon, Mothma, Mon Mothma's costumes. So let's hear what she says. I worked with our genius costume designer, Michael Wilkinson, very closely. He has a beautiful eye and he worked with Francoise and Malin and the, th the, the three of them curated her outfits in a way that I haven't been able to experience before in film or television. Michael, Malin and Francoise worked almost as with me, almost as if we were in an atelier for haute couture. They crafted and curated and created these beautiful, beautiful pieces of wardrobe that I never knew Mon Mothma would have had. It was a joy to be given the opportunity not only to wear those costumes and to feel different as Mon Mothma in them, but also to help craft them with Michael Wilkinson. And I'm looking forward to yourself and fans to seeing Mon Mothma in those pieces of work and seeing that labor of love on screen. I mean, and then she said, haute couture. Oh. <laughs> like, ooh, how fun must, the, must those sessions have been? Those costume sure. you know, fittings, right? Fit outfits that are made for her, for you yeah. and the character and custom and beautiful and spend you spend hours and hours and hours like you know it could be hundreds of hours on those type of dresses and I can't wait for the cosplayers to dive into these costumes and recreate them at the next celebration so it'll probably be one of those things where you get to pick one costume because they're so elaborate yes yeah and I mean Genevieve as we mentioned before we started recording you had mentioned that Genevieve takes a lot of pauses in her conversation because she doesn't want to give something away because you know she talked about how they crafted the costumes but she never really answered the real question underneath which was how did those inform your performance so she never really delved into that <laughs> she's like being a that. good star wars actress she you, is you have an answer prepared and you give that answer or you don't that sort of lends into it maybe she went mm -hmm. to dave filoni school you know, yeah, he yes. never really answers the question. He answers the question he wanted you to ask. Yep. The Zootopia Dave Filoni school. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I got to ask her a question and, you know, we alluded to some private scenes in her home as opposed to the Senate or giving speeches to rebels, which is what we've already seen her do. And I wanted to ask this question. So what is it about her personality that you thought was most important to portray in these scenes? And also because you have so much experience playing Mon Mothma over 20 years, what have you brought from your life experience to these private scenes? It's wonderful to know the public woman, to know her serenity, to know her um, dignity, and to have the opportunity as an actor when she enters a private space to be able to let that go to be able to take a cloak off. In fact, maybe in it, I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly, but maybe in that first scene, you see me take off the Imperial uh, medal. And I wanted to, 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 to do that, to show that in life, sometimes we have to release ourselves from the robes we, were, we wear. And that was what we we're reaching for with, um, the different sides of Mon Mothma through Andor to reassess who she is publicly when we see who she is privately. What is, can, can we break down that serenity? Can we break through that glass that she is and see what is perhaps more chaotic and more difficult and more painful in her private life? And then how does that inform who the woman, the woman she is going forward? 
how much can that give texture to this public woman that we know we know we know going forward if we know the 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 pain or the the cost in her private life that she has had to carry with her and again we have a clothing answer <laughs> i really liked that metaphor of taking off the cloak so i will be looking for these telltale signs in scenes that inform the character i'm excited about that that's that's so cool because there is this conversation about among the actors about intentionality of even the things you do taking off the cloak is telling you something about the character so nothing happens within a scene where there isn't some intention behind it so the character just doesn't come in and take off their cloak because they're telling you that they're stepping from from one role to another role in that scene and I thought that was just so really smart and cool how she says it. So you know that those conversations are happening because they just come out when they are asked a question. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's really cool to watch movies and see what you can tell in a scene that's telling you about their character. That's not the character's dialogue. I think it's really important. Um, I have a random example, and this is very random, but I'm going to bring it up now. So Richard and I have been re-watching all the Batman movies, starting with the 1960s version of Batman. But we we are up to The Dark Knight Rises. And there's a scene in which Bruce Wayne is talking with Alfred and Alfred's like laying some truths on him. And Alfred is like saying, OK, well, I'm going to leave if you don't do this. And the scene is like a crossroads in their relationship. And it is on the landing of a staircase in which so at the end of the scene Bruce Wayne walks up the stairs and it's like the whole scene was this crossroads and it was really cool but the setting kind of told you what was happening in their relationship it was neat yep I love when that happens so now we are going to move on to like the unexpected best part of this roundtable day and we are going to talk to Denise Guff and Kyle Soler and the chemistry that these two have together is just undeniable. And they were having so much fun that we had fun with them. For sure. I, I mean, I have to say there's nothing that we've seen that's given us any inclination that they should have been paired together in nope. conversation. But you will understand as they talk about their characters, why they put them together. And they're both on the bad side. So... Mm -hmm. But, and the way they talk about it is just brilliant. So the first question was from Brandon at Talking Bay 94, and it was regarding their characters as, as villains in Star Wars that don't see themselves as villains. Well, Tony crafted a like pretty well-rounded three-dimensional characters first off and so that made it kind of easy to understand that you know we're not in a world of star wars where it's you know goodies and baddies it's uh it's kind of a deeper um exploration of you know the light and shade in everyone and therefore it's holding a mirror up to anyone watching you know there but for the grace of whatever you believe in who knows if you were in dedra's situation maybe you'd do exactly the same thing I mean, who wouldn't torture a few people to get to where they need to get to? <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like Dedra thinks she's the hero of every story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I certainly think Cyril believes he's the hero of his own journey. I remember speaking to Tony at the very beginning when he was fleshing out the arc of the character and he was like, I don't really know where he ends up, you know? I mean, is he good? Is he bad? I, I don't know. And, and so I decided to take that kind of conflict that gray area which exists all throughout Andor and exists really in in Cassian actually which yeah. was you know beautifully presented in in row one it's a really human condition to question the entire time is this the right thing I should be doing mm -hmm. and Cyril really comes from a place of lack and of hunger to strive and be recognized and to have power and station and some form of identity that he can find within this political structure of fascism, basically. 
And that um, makes you like really ripe for that sort of yeah. that fascist thinking, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, because it's, it's so black and white. If you do this, you will have power. Yeah. If you get this guy, you there will have. There is no have... gray. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. for people who exist on both spectrums to move into that world where there is no gray, it's dangerous because mm. their own shades are all taken out and you just become quite viciously ruthless. Yeah. Ruthless. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, right off the bat, we're learning more about these characters than even whatever we've seen from Andor. Like, they they were giving us some little clues here. So let's move on then to James Burns from Jedi News, who asked about both their characters being in security and if they learn anything from each other. Oh, God. I think we found in it, well, I can only speak for myself, but when I met... uh kyle's character when i met cyril as dedra i was like oh this makes total sense yeah. you know we had this thing happen too where in my fitting for my costume i i put the uniform on and i was like yeah it's great of course but i need it tailored and fitted and it needs to be really perfect and and the costume designer said that's hilarious because that's what cyril needed too so it was really clear <laughs> that they're both like super meticulous and tidy and clean and they want everything perfect and yeah. that's why you know they sort of they're like imperial match. imperial twin flames and definitely they like totally find and see each other within the other yeah and it's like a love story <laughs> <laughs> like an evil love story <laughs> And I think, I think, you know, from Cyril's perspective, he, he, he has an interesting journey where um, he starts out quite high and then he experiences a loss and he, he regains strength through finding Dedra. And so that's. Yeah. And Dedra starts at the opposite. So I'm yeah. like at the bottom of the, of the, the, the ladder, you know, and I'm faced with the kind of ineptitude of so many of the men that I'm working for and with. And then she slowly through her own kind of determination and her kind of attention to detail, she rises up at the time when he's going down. So it's like mm. they meet just in this perfect storm of like each of them needing each other at exactly the right time. Mm. Dedra is less sort of um open to it initially you know she doesn't want to share this stuff with anyone but then once it's really clear that he's useful um, persuasively evil yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they live happily ever after it's kind of simple <laughs> okay okay evil love story what when when they were saying that i'm like writing down like richard and i are on the zoom we're like evil love story like writing big notes like that could be oh my god that was hilarious and they call themselves the twin flames i mean there were just these like they have these nicknames it was such a bizarre conversation the energy between them is so as you can tell as you're listening to them talk they're having so much fun you know just them they're talking about romance uh he was the only person other than diego who had white on everybody else in all the interviews was dressed in black and i just thought that was like really interesting too so here i am like my brain's going to like lost stars i'm like oh, lost stars lost stars you know the the bad guys and one of them figures it out and then they're separated by you know passions for i don't know i don't know what's going on but it was just it was so, my brain's just spinning in places. So it was so much fun. So Richard got to ask a question too. So let's hear that conversation. Bright suns, you two. Whoa, hey. hello. Hey, Hi. we are oh Richard. God, there's so much going on here. There's that C-3PO in the background. Well oh done. my God, that's Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a where's Waldo. System. Yeah, After just seeing the first four episodes, your your characters are so well defined. Did you model your characters after either someone in the Star Wars universe or in history or from another film? No, I, I think we both just took what was on the page and we had a um, really good connection with Tony Gilroy, who, you know, came up with the first few scripts and then had arcs mm -hmm. for our character. And we really fleshed it out with him and I think I think you know if you know about Star Wars if you've ever seen it you know the ghosts of those other characters probably always live within the walls of the sets and everything mm. and, and in the pages but 
but what Tony really created was something new and mm -hmm. fresh. And these, these really conflicted villains who, yeah. you know, are existing in a gray area trying to find their way. And, yeah. and so I think they were totally unique. But Gus Fring from Breaking Bad is always oh, yeah, like yeah, my yeah. favorite. I don't know. There's just something about his meticulousness and his, his sort of complete detachment and yet his ability to kind of perform in the real world. Like you see him in, you know, the chicken place and talking to normal people. And then you see him go and prepare to murder someone. And so there's, there was something very satisfying about a character like Gus Fring for me as Dedra. He definitely fit into our squad. I definitely yeah. think so. Yeah. So I think, I wouldn't, I don't kind of, I don't base Stedra on him, but he's in the tribe of villains that, yeah, for sure, that's somebody we would invite in to our home <laughs> yeah. that we live in together now in, you know, Disney villain yeah. world. Yeah. And Ben Mendelsohn in Rogue One. Yeah, yeah. He's got to come. Always. <laughs> dead. There we go. <laughs> Everyone's dead. Sorry, guys. Disney are brutal. <laughs> Again, this praise of Tony Gilroy. This pops up over and over, this running theme. And uh, they are giving great ideas because I just want to see like a Disney Plus show with all the villains together and Gus Fring like, <laughs> ringleadering them or something. How awesome would that be? It would be. It would be. <laughs> I, I don't know, but we were both so excited after that round table. And I hope other people are walking away listening to this going yeah yeah I'm excited to see more about those characters I mean you won't see her character until episode four so mm -hmm. you know that's just we have a little bit of ways to go there but I'm excited to get there for what we're gonna yeah. see and they were alluding they were alluding to some interesting things in their relationship as characters so I mean evil love story come on I'm <laughs> I'm excited I'm like so it's definitely excited. Definitely a tease. It's a tease. You know how I feel about love stories in Star Wars, you guys. <laughs> Someone that we will be seeing in the first three episodes is Adria Arjona, and she's asked about why she loves Bix. Oh, I liked a lot of things about Bix. I think she's um, fearless and she's bold, yet really deep inside, she's incredibly loyal and compassionate and cares a little too much for the people around her. And I think that sometimes at her own detriment, I think this boldness and powerful thing is sort of like a facade that she puts on for, she almost puts that as a show, but deep down she, she cares deeply about the people around her. And I think that's the part that I love the most about, about Bix. No, Bix is going to be an important character, so I'm glad that, that we got to hear from her. We didn't get a separate roundtable with her. This was from the press conference, uh, but, you know, she was there and really passionate about her character. And then they all got to show their passion for the story itself in this really great question where they were asked about highlights uh, from on the set of Andor. And it was like a bevy of excitement. Kyle, we'll start with you. Any highlights or fun moments working on location? Were there little details that stood out for you? Oh man, I mean, all of it. Um, but yeah, I remember um, coming to set, one of the sets, the town that had been built by the um, production design and the set units and um, every little thing had been thought of. Every single drawer had something in it. Every cabinet had, I don't know, a whole life inside. And there was this whole crowd milling about before we'd started filming. And the crowd kind of somehow parted. And there was this line of stormtroopers. And at that point, I'd sort of forgotten that I was in Star Wars because I was like, oh, I'm in this socio-political drama yeah. that's also a, like family drama and a love story and there's all this like amazing stuff going on that's like relevant to today and oh shit there are a bunch of <laughs> stormtroopers and I like I yeah I dropped my coffee and my inner child was like pretty happy 
Yeah, so similarly, it was on the same set as um, as Kyle's talking about, and it was so intricate and so beautiful. And you see, I don't have any Star Wars background. Like, I never watched it. I was so into Batman as a little girl. I, I didn't um, have any connection to the Star Wars universe, really. And then I'm standing there, and I have this really cool coat on and my gun, and, and then I'm given two death troopers who are walking behind me, and I started going dun, 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 dun. and then all the extras started and so suddenly I'm walking through this set and I'm thinking even I as somebody who is not in any way an aficionado <laughs> of this stuff I cannot believe that I'm here doing this and then just over the last week like when it's, I'd kind of forgotten it's Star Wars, you know, and then suddenly you're introduced, the trailer comes out and the poster and I'm like, oh my God, I'm, my nephews are going nuts. It's all just, now it's just one big, like, oh my God, yeah. I'm in Star Wars. I wish I knew more about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to study. I'm gonna study. <laughs> I feel like we're all going to talk about the same set. It was just in, in my like I remember, and for some reason, I remember like 10 city blocks. That's how big it felt for me. I think maybe it wasn't, but I just remember like the first day sort of walking around and 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 kind of getting lost in it and exploring. And it was so, it was so cool. And, and I also had made like a silly rookie decision of really going into this show and saying like, I'm not, I'm not in Star Wars. I'm making conscious decision that I'm not in Star Wars. I'm in this amazing show that Tony Devell, I'm, we're doing this. And then everything was a constant reminder. So it was like, oh crap. Every prop that was giving, every set that you would walk in, everything's like, oh man, I really am in Star Wars. And sort of like Kyle said, your inner child starts coming out and the butterflies are going. You're like, what did I get myself into? Like, I can't get out of it now. Um, yeah, that set was, was incredible. I remember um, there was one day where the director, one of our directors told, told me to run. And I was like, well, where do you want me to run? He's like, anywhere you want. Cause everything was filmable. Every, he, if I would go left, we could have filmed there. If I would go right, we could have filmed there. And it was just me exiting. And he could basically point the camera either left or right. And that was, that was kind of, that was kind of cool. So they all were basically talking about one moment, like the same moment. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> <laughs> i wonder if this is where tony gilroy played the music that that diego luna was talking about too it could be but i'm getting a, like a theme here right that we talk about these costumes going to extremes for mon Mothma's costumes we're talking about these sets that are so big that you could film in any direction uh just costumes and sets and just scope like this is like different from the volume where, you know, sometimes you felt Kenobi was limited by things that were um, the way they had to film in the volume, you, uh, even though there were, and they did spend money in other places in Kenobi. There were things that they wanted to do that they put their value in and, but the volume limits you to a certain thing. This is going to, they want it to feel real. It's Star Wars, but they want it to feel real. Like if you're watching the crown, that's what I think of when mm. I think of this, you know, these elaborate, large cast there's lots of extras they're you know peep they're putting a lot of people in costumes in order to show kind of the scope of what's happening as a historical piece in star wars mm. yeah it's interesting and i i really don't know what's better like the volume versus physical sets because the volume really expands the space right and so like the actors feel like they're on a physical set so i i don't know you'd, you'd almost have to ask people who's filmed in both i mean what do you think you would like better i think it depends on the situation you know it depends on what you're trying to do but you know if i were given the choice could i go out and be in a real space i mean that's part of production it's a cost to put a bunch of people in a plane and go someplace especially some places that are really way remote and it costs money to do that and to move people. So sometimes the volume just makes more sense. And if they can spend more time on different aspects of the story, then that's fine. It's something you have to weigh in balance. But in this case, it just seems exciting to, to know that 
they're they weren't limited by anything like it wasn't like well I have to film this way because that's the way the volume shaped and that's how what we have to design to got it so on this idea of like the immenseness of what they're trying to do we got he was asked about the world building of the story and let's listen to Tony Gilroy talk about it I grew up uh, I grew up in upstate New York and uh, and it won't go into details about it, but it was a place where it was a, kind of a blue collar place and everybody always had jobs and it was a weird kind of thing. And we all had, you know, when you were like 12, you went out and got working papers. It was an odd thing. And you, you know, it worked for Masons. I was a plumber's apprentice and all kinds of jobs, you know, things and ran a painting company. And it's a place where, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an idealized, uh, fantasy of mine, I suppose, of a, of a community that's, that's been stable and, 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 uh, benevolent and, and, and thriving. And there's no real, we don't really have any economic diversity there. Really. It's, it's, everybody seems to be, it's kind of, um, I suppose it's my utopian mechanical side, um, fantasy in a way of a, of a, of a, of a place that really, really functions um, taking things apart and putting them back together again. So now all these actors had talked about their favorite moment on this giant set. So Tony Gilroy now talks about this amazing set and the conception of it. It was just a, you know, we, we talked before about the set and the thing that they were talking about. Our production designer, Luke Hall, who did Chernobyl, I mean, he's just, uh, he, he really is uh, in the brain trust that puts the show together with Zana and Luke and Mo and Leo, my brother, John Gilroy, Kathy, the core group of people that put this together. I mean, Luke is just, uh, I mean, he's Mozart and he's a young production designer and he's just soaring. And they, they built an eight and a half acre city for us that we will use for all 12 episodes. And as they said, it's a, it's a 360 set. And um, the community that we were allowed to build within it and the social structures and the rituals of it, because um, there are some really intense rituals about it. Uh, it really feels like a place. Uh, look, what is it? You get to play God. We built a place. We built a whole culture. We built a whole life. We built a whole tradition. We had people care about it in different ways. It's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic maximal expression of imagination to be able to do this. Uh, it's, it's just fantastic to be able to do it. It's thrilling. I'm I'm excited for everybody to see. Obviously, we've seen uh, the first four episodes, so we know what they're talking about this, but I hope this gives you an idea and gets you really excited for what you're going to see in the story and how it really helped inform even the culture that the, you that you get to know in this in the story, because he's not other than Coruscant. We are not on known planets. They are mm -hmm. building new cultures and ideas in places in the star wars which is really exciting to me they weren't like oh we got to go in the canon source book and pick a place that works for us and of course that has to be a place because that's what it is that's the center of the galaxy far far away right and then we think about this vast star wars universe but a lot of people can't get away from the fact that it's been used as a way to represent different people and particularly Diego Luna, when he came in to play Cassian, he didn't give up his accent and including Diego, Adria Arjona is also uh, representing the Hispanic community in Star Wars. And they got asked about that, uh, what it means to, to represent in Star Wars. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, Diego has, you know, he's been doing it for way longer than me, but it just, I don't know, it, 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 it gives me hope that now a little girl is going to watch and be like, oh my God, that girl kind of looks like me. And maybe I want to be like her in Halloween or whatever that may be. But um, it's really, it's really exciting. Um, and it's sort of comes to show how things are sort of shifting. And, and I'm happy that that Tony sort of brought me along, but it wasn't part of the conversation, which was, I think the most beautiful thing about it. It wasn't like, Oh, you're Hispanic. So you need to be in this. It was, Tony was like, Oh, you're, you're Bix. And it's never justified or we 
never even had a conversation about my own ethnicity. I think it was really just about the work. Um, and I, I truly hope for in the future that that question kind of isn't asked as much anymore, that it sort of becomes this normality where we're seeing two actors like Diego and I in Star Wars is 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 cool and it's the norm. Um, yeah. yeah. Diego, to you on that question? Yeah, I mean, I I think the 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 industry is reacting to something that's happening out there, you know, and it's it's supposed to uh, we're supposed to be a mirror, you know, for audiences to be able to to see themselves there and uh, and uh, gladly. And I think with uh, the platforms and these new new ways to connect with audiences. I think audiences are sending the right messages, you know, uh, and the industry is reacting. I think when when you when you buy a ticket, you send a message. When you don't buy it, you also send a message. When you click, you send a message. When you don't, you send a message. And the industry will respond to that, and it is it's responding, you know. I think. Uh, uh, it makes sense if we're talking about a galaxy uh, where there's so many planets that people come from different places, you know. And if we're talking about refugees, they come from different places and uh, and they and they have they gather in one one place and uh, and they sound different, they look different, and that diversity. I mean, it's it's what makes this the reality I live in very rich, you know. So I really. I mean, I celebrate that the the stories we see reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be cool to get to a place where we don't have to ask, you know, like, oh, we need we need a certain this person here, insert this kind of you know background here. Like, it's just it just happens. Like, I've been watching a lot of Star Trek lately, and it's there's all these representations of everyone involved in the and it's a future that you know a better future than what we have. And so I, I hope that we'll get there someday. And then Tony was asked, who is this show for? And I thought it was a great answer. So let's let him have a go at it. Well, look, I mean, there's no secret. We, uh, the show exists because there's an enormous arterial, important, passionate Star Wars community. Uh, and I know it's not a monolithic community. There's many different versions and factions within it, but there's this huge dedicated Star Wars community that shows up for all. And, and, and they have been, that's our whole card. That's what gave us the, the money and the momentum and the ability to make a show that's this, this insanely big. I mean, this abundant and this difficult to make that audience is our primary concern. And, we want to bring something to them that is a completely different lane than what they've had before, but there's, we're doing it in a completely uncynical fashion. There's, there's nothing cynical about our show. We, our primary, our, our, the word we use more every day. And I was at Pinewood today prepping for two is real. We want to make this real. This place is real to us and we will bring a lot of things to that community um, that we hope they're really interested in and we hope they really appreciate it and we hope they really appreciate the passion that we've tried to make it real. But at the same time, there's no secret. Their partner, their boss, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their mother, their father, a lot of people that are Star Wars adjacent or Star Wars averse. And <laughs> you should be able to watch our show. Our show is designed that you should not... You could, you, this could be your entry point to Star Wars. You could watch our 24 episodes. That could be your way in. Uh, we're doing a show that does not require any prior knowledge whatsoever to get involved. And our hope is that, um, you know, I mean, that's the gamble. Can we, uh, can we, can we satisfy and, 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 and electrify and, 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 and excite the dedicated fans? And can we, at the same time, bring something that's so uh, intense emotionally and so seems so true and is, you know, the smallest domestic dramas and the smallest interpersonal relationships that are dropped down in the midst of the epic, tectonic, revolutionary, historical moments where people have to make huge decisions. Can we attract another audience that's interested in that as well? Can we marry those two things together? 
that's the gamble. That's what we're trying to do. And um, that's what we, <laughs> that's, that's why we're here. Okay. So I'm always curious to know people who get into Star Wars different ways, certain ways, you know, like my friends, Courtney, well, Courtney Turkel and Kelly Turkel, they do the Neverland Clubhouse podcast with me. And Courtney has always been into Star Wars, but Kelly had not. And so the Mandalorian ended up being her way into Star Wars. And she found like she had seen some of them, but wasn't too into it. And so when she saw little baby Yoda, she was like all in. She's like, oh, this is this is uh, she loved that series. So I'm I'm going to be curious after this airs to talk with anyone who this was their gateway in and why. Yeah, really curious. But you know, there's every time there's a new show, there seems to be a way that that brings people in. And even people, they talk about Star Wars like, oh, the movie. It was a book. They had put the book out before the movie came out even, you know, so people went to that movie because they'd read the book and they were intrigued. And so there's always this cycle of different ways that people come into Star Wars. So it's a TV show, a movie. It could have been some people through the book, some people through the comics, some, some people, people through the games too. Yeah. Video games. Yeah. Absolutely. I Nights mean, of the Old when Republic. you talk about that, there's huge swaths of fandom that are in that gaming community that like is so like, to me, I, I don't know even parts of it, but I know that there's just a huge swath of people that that's their way in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that wraps it up. We hope you all are going to check out Andor after that, or at least are really excited. Or if you've been waiting excitedly, this filled the gap because it feels like a long way away from when we thought we were going to have it. So no a reminder, <laughs> yes, that we have our Zoom Saturday discussion, Star Wars and Marvel. And we're talking about She-Hulk now in that wait for new Andor. And that's Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific time, hosted by Sandra. And we will be doing those uh, every week rolling out a She-Hulk. And at some point we're going to be talking about both of them and or She-Hulk because they do cross over. If you don't quite get there at 5 p.m., you guys, or, you know, the time that it starts, you know, come in an hour later, come in a couple hours later. <laughs> It'll still <laughs> be still rolling. Be talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for joining us today. And if you guys want to get a hold of us, you can visit us over at fangirlsgoingrogue.com. We are also on social media. So we are at FG Going Rogue. Trisha is at Fangirl Cantina. I am at Jedi Tink. And Sandra is at Geek Chic 9. You can leave us a voicemail 33121 Ewoks or 331213. 9657. Or you can send us an email, contact at fangirlsgoingrogue.com. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search Fangirls Going Rogue. You can then like the page or request to join the group and answer the questions that pop up. And please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a positive five star review. We need more reviews so more people can find us. So until next time, do 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 do. Yup. 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 So, uh, hi, I'm Keith Yard from um, Father Sun Galaxy Star Wars podcast. <clears throat> What's up, Keith? So, oh my God, Keith. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi. Me. Sorry, I'm really excited to meet you, Keith. You're the youngest really? person we've had. Yeah, yeah, because you're the youngest person we've had. And we've been saying through this whole junket, we've been saying the thing that we love about being in Star Wars is that a really young person can speak to a really old person about like the same older thing. Than us, yeah. but about the same thing and be as excited. And now you're proving our point. Yes. yes. Oh my God. This is so yes. exciting. Okay. Ask us anything. We will give you every spoiler. Give you all the answers. We will yeah. tell you everything. Goopa, <laughs> noopa.